Sıradaki konuşmacımız Sayın Doktor Halil Güven. Doktor Güven şu anda Gürcistan Cumhuriyeti'ndeki San Diego Eyalet Üniversitesi kampüsünün dekanlığını yürütmektedir. Daha önce Türkiye ve Kıbrıs'ın kuzeyinde üç farklı üniversitenin rektörlüğünü, başkanlığını üstlenmiştir. İstanbul Türkiye'de Bahçeşehir Üniversitesi'nin kurucu rektörü olarak, Kıbrıs'ın kuzeyinde Doğu Akdeniz Üniversitesi rektörü olarak ve Türkiye'de İstanbul Bilgi Üniversitesi rektörü olarak görev yapmıştır. 1998 yılında Türkiye'de İstanbul Bilgi Üniversitesi rektörü olarak görev yapmıştır. Doktor Güven San Diego Eyalet Üniversitesi'nde makine mühendisliği profesörü olarak San Diego Eyalet Üniversitesi'nin enerji mühendisliği enstitüsü ve San Diego Eyalet Üniversitesi'nin enerji analiz teşhis merkezinin direktörlüğünü yapmıştır. Kıbrıs, Türkiye, Gürcistan Cumhuriyeti ve Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde yüksek öğrenim ve üniversite yönetimindeki geniş deneyimleriyle e, Doktor Güven, alternatif enerji, enerji verimliliği, enerji santrali mühendisliği ve sürdürülebilirlik konularında uzmanlaşmış bir enerji uzmanıdır. Doktor Güven lisans derecesini Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nden, yüksek lisans derecesini ise Fulbright bursu ile Mississippi Eyalet Üniversitesi'nden, doktora derecesini ise University of Houston'dan, makine mühendisliği bölümünde gelişmekte olan ülkelere alternatif enerji ve teknoloji transferleri konusunda uzmanlığını alarak tamamlamıştır. San Diego Eyalet Üniversitesi'nde sanayi ve üretim tesisleri için uygulamalı enerji araştırmaları üzerinde Enerji Mühendisliği Enstitüsü ve küçük ve orta ölçekli endüstriyel tesisler tarafından enerji kullanımını değerlendirmek üzere Amerika Birleşik Devletleri Enerji Bakanlığı tarafından finanse edilen Endüstriyel Değerlendirme Merkezi olmak üzere iki önemli merkezin kurumu ve yönetmiştir. Enerji Mühendisliği Enstitüsü'ndeki çalışmaları sebebiyle Amerika Birleşik Devletleri Enerji Bakanlığı'ndan Enerji İnovasyon Ödülünü almıştır. İki dönem Başkan Yardımcılığı ve Enerji Mühendisleri Birliği San Diego Şubesi'nde bir dönem başkanlık yapmıştır. Diğer birçok ödülünün yanında Otomotiv Mühendisleri Derneği'nden Titor Eğitimci Ödülü ve San Diego Mühendislik Topluluklarından Mühendislik Mesleği ve Topluma Adanmış Hizmetler Bakımından Değerli Mühendislik Eğitimcisi Ödülünü almıştır. Hakemli Bilimsel Dergilerindeki Enerji sistemlerindeki sayısız makalesinin yanı sıra Doktor Güven küreselleşme, liderlik, medeniyetler ve eğitim çatışması üzerine yayınlanmış kitaplar ve kitap bölümleri bulunmaktadır. Harvard Eğitim Enstitüsü'nün 2000'de yeni üniversite başkanları için Harvard seminerinde yer almıştır. Türkçe, İngilizce ve orta seviyede İspanyolca bilmektedir. Doktor Güven Kırpıs'ta doğmuş, evli ve 5 erkek çocuk babasıdır. San Diego State Üniversitesi'nin dekanı Sayın Doktor Halil Güven'in çevresel sürdürülebilirlikte ve yeşil işlerde enerji verimliliğinin rolü konulu sunumu ile yapması için buraya davet ediyorum. This was a long version of my bio. I apologize this for this after lunch. <gülüyor> I should have provided this more than the shorter version. Ee, önce teşekkür etmek istiyorum davet için. Ee, çok güzel bir konferans. Ee, 2013'te ilk defa yine bu salonda Yeksem'in konferansında beraber olmuştuk. 2017'deki Elektrik Mühendisi Odası'nın konferansında buradaydı. Ee, 2013'ten beri Türk Kıbrıs'ta muazzam bir ilerleme oldu yeni enerji sektöründe. 2013'te sadece Serhatköy'deki fotovoltaik sistemi vardı. Şimdi her tarafta var. Dolayısıyla çok e, sevinçliyim tekrar. Kıbrıs'ta olmaktan ve yine böyle bir konferansta gayet yüksek seviye bir konferansta bulunmaktan e, çok mutluyum. Çok teşekkür ediyorum İnşaat Mühendisi Odası'na bu davet için. Gülcan Yalıcı Hanım'a çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ve İngilizce olduğu için ben de İngilizce devam edeceğim sunuşuma. Fakat sunuş arasında e, biraz önce, benden önce sunuş yapanların anlattıklarının aslında çok bağlantı var. Onlarla, onlara zamanı gelince göstereceğim. E, iş, i̇ş bulma, jobs derken sabahleyin sunu biraz değiştirip gelmeden e, birkaç slide eklemiştim. Onlarla başlayalım. E, eklediğim slide şuydu. Şimdi sabahleyin e, Gürkan Bey yeni işlerin ne olacağını önümüzdeki yıllarda ne tip işler olacağı konusunda bir bir, bir, bir noktaya değinmişti. 
Uh, I put this slide in the morning uh, because the topic is, is jobs. So that being the case, where we're going to talk about jobs, I thought, well, I'll talk about this, which is something we use in, the, in trying to, to communicate to kids about the importance of technology. Uh, because right now I'm heading a campus in science, technology, engineering, math. So the number of STEM graduates in the world is declining, but we need more STEM graduates. That being the case, uh, this is a slide which we show about telephone. Telephone started being a widespread thing in, in after Second World War. In Cyprus, after the war ended, they started putting telephone poles and putting telephone in different regions. It took 75 years to reach 50 million users. It took 38 years to have radio have 50 million users. Facebook took three and a half years, and Angry Birds only 35 days. So, uh, Dean talked about how fast we're connected to the world now, so everybody in Cyprus knows Angry Birds as well, while way back when it wasn't like that. Well, now, look at the companies. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, these companies did not exist in the year 2000. And the Google missed it around two years, established in 1998. And Wi-Fi was a misspelled word in 2000, still is misspelled. My, my, my word doesn't recognize it as an acceptable word. So keep in mind that the jobs that we graduate students in universities do not exist. We graduate students for jobs that we don't know what they are. We just teach them and hopefully they'll be able to learn more to get to be gainfully employed. So we're living in an environment, a world that's changing fast. And now there is green jobs that we have to worry about. But maybe in a few years there won't be green jobs. Well, this is not a pretty sight. I mean, what we are looking at as millennial challenges, the problems that need to be solved in this century is piling up. And, of course, global warming and climate change is on the top of the list, but there's also urbanization and pollution, energy and cybersecurity, energy security issues. Then there is, of course, emerging disease threats because of global warming, poverty, wars and terrorism, refugees. And we need to tackle these in a growing world. If you look at the two pictures, this is Shanghai in 1987. There's a clock tower here, and it is there. But look what's behind it. So these three things will dominate, and will get more and more pulled into this, so Cyprus cannot be isolated from this. So world population growth, urbanization, and of course, energy. Well, in a few minutes ago, Sam mentioned that the overall energy increased by 2.3%. Uh, even though there is a lot of attempts to have renewables, conservation, etc., it's growing. Why? Well, world population is going to be 2000, in 2050, it's going to be 10 billion. It was supposed to be 9, but in 2011, United Nations declared 31st of October as the 7th billionth day. At that time, they changed the forecast from 9 to 10. And two-thirds of these people will be living in the city. So right now, we're, if we look at two-thirds of 10 billion, that's 6.7 billion people that will live in cities. Right now, we're at 7.6 billion. So we're constantly building, right? We're constantly building things. We see high-rises built everywhere. And there is still about 2 billion people out of 7 in 2011 that didn't have electricity. So United Nations report in 2011 pointed that 2 billion people lived without electricity out of 7. Imagine when we are 10 billion. Then, of course, electricity demand, because when you have urbanization, when you have people living in cities, concentrated population density, then you need more electricity. And by 2030, we have to double the electricity to supply the cities that are being built. So here is the graph, and the Sam showed an you know, updated version of this. 
So on the right, if we are 10 billion, 6.7 billion will live in the cities. We need fresh water, electricity, housing for all these people. And you see the electricity supply or energy supply is one on one with population growth. As population grows, we have to find additional energy sources to supply. But this is not the whole story. More people, you need more food, more fresh water, more minerals, and we're depleting the resource base, producing pollution from burning fuel, producing food, pumping groundwater, harvesting wood, producing cement. Terrible, though. Uh, producing cement to build buildings to consume electricity that we don't have. So more people, more cement, more cars, more iPhones, more internet, more jobs. So people, as the population rises, you need to have welfare. I mean, to, you have to provide livelihood for them, including jobs. So a simple economical analysis is that if you have zero economic growth, then, this is the bottom, then energy supply can be zero. But we need to grow because population is growing, right? Economy must grow. If economy grows 2%, energy supply must grow 2%. As simple as that. So, countries like India, China, they try to increase income per capita. They try to increase welfare for their citizens. As a result, they have to continue building power plants. Because if economy cannot grow, they cannot produce extra wood. At the same time, population is growing. So you need to keep producing cement to build housing. So the picture is bleak. I mean, 2050, Gujana mentioned 20 years. Well, 30 years is 2050 with 10 billion people. So something has to be done now. Uh, but, well, Energy is part of this equation. There are other things that need to be done. So I added a, a, one last suggestion at the end of my presentation. What else can be done? So here is Paris Accord, 2015. It links energy with environment. Obviously, it's linked. If you're trying to build power plants, it pollutes the environment, carbon dioxide emissions. United Nations Framework for Convention on Climate Change. This, this is the full name of it. It's, it's called Paris Accord because it was signed in Paris. It's supposed to limit global warming to 2%, urgent need to decarbonize, reduce damage to the environment. 196 nations will continue following Kyoto Agreement. It ends next year, 2020. And we need 55 countries that produce at least 55% of the global warming global greenhouse emissions to sign so that Paris Accord can go into effect. So this is what we govern after Kyoto Agreement ends. Well, along with this, in, starting 2020, EU will put in $100 billion a year into developing countries to reduce pollution. So they'd be investing in renewable technologies, they'd be <laughs> financing projects to help developing countries deal with climate change, like, like India, so they'd provide funding. This project is funded, actually I put down sponsor down there because it's funded in this context. So in 2020, there'd be a lot of money available to engage in this. So there is hope, there's a plan. This plan is in danger, well, before it gets in danger, let me, well, this was already discussed, this is 2020-2024 EU. Then, of course, 2030 target is 40-27-27, but Ireland already met 40 as well, right? So, so you're there before it's 2030. Congratulations. Yeah. So now, right now, the targets look like everything is met except the reducing energy consumption because population is rising, right? Well, this is, the, this is what it looks like when you look at Paris Accord. Obama signed it, he canceled it. So Obama said, okay, we'll go with 20% energy efficiency. 
in 2014. Right now, it's on hold. Uh, well, California continues. So they're talking about Cal exit. Maybe, maybe they can do it so that um, Trump is not welcomed in California. He, he, he's going to visit, I think, this month or something like that for some fundraising, but he doesn't go to California. He's, he's not welcome there. So by 2020, one third of the energy in California to be produced from renewable energy sources. So California is on track with this. So going up to 33%. Well, coming to construction, so this being a chamber of construction or civil engineers, well, the biggest problem is buildings. See, even 50% of all the energy used is in buildings. We keep building new buildings, and they need to use electricity. 75% of all the electricity used in the United States goes to buildings. It's not industry, it's not transportation. In the EU, it's about 44%, but it's the same story, and it's becoming more and more in all the countries, because when you have increased uh, density, then the only way you can solve it, you cannot burn wood in the, in the balcony to, to cook, wolf, <laughs> cook food, you have to use some other sources. And 40% of greenhouse emissions come from buildings. It's not in, it's, and people think that cars are the biggest polluters, but actually, if you look at it in this way, where buildings are using electricity, which, con which pollutes the environment, it is the buildings that's the problem. So buildings must be tackled. What can be done? Well, in Cyprus, some things are being done, but I think more should be done, where there should be more energy efficiency. The building energy efficiency must be tighter, so I think the government should take measures to require contractors to, to be more proactive in reducing or building the buildings in such a way that there's insulation, building them with double glaze, etc. It is much better than Georgia. Georgia has absolutely no standards. So I've been giving lectures in Georgia as well, attending conferences, trying to get them to start. But you know, country is not rich. Income per capita is about four thousand dollars per person. So they're not implementing any any guidelines. But in Cyprus is better, but more can be done. Then the second one is, of course, investing in renewable energy. This is already underway. And, of course, the next step will be net zero energy buildings. Now, this is, this is not a dream. It is possible. There is already goals set for net zero energy buildings in the United States. So if you reduce first to make sure that the building has natural heating, cooling, use as much as possible daylighting, <coughs> do all the insulation necessary, don't put any windows in the west side if you're in a country like Cyprus. I have a room now that looks at the west side. It's terrible. I, I, I turn all the... But anyway, and that's a balcony as well. Uh, well, architecture, this is now... I guess Alibe is going to make a speech later about architecture. So this is architecture. I taught in architecture for a couple of years, talking to architects about being energy efficient. So this is my experience in teaching in architectural school, where there is 2030 challenge in the United States to have 100% of the buildings in the United States net zero energy buildings. By 2020, 80% will be net zero, meaning the building will consume energy, but it will produce as much as a result the building will be net zero, so there will be photovoltaics and other measures taken. So building will produce energy at the same time it's consuming. So by 2030, all buildings will be net zero and carbon neutral. And California implements now energy use index. Maybe you can do this when you go home. If you can find your electricity bill, you need to calculate how many square meters you have. Hopefully it's not 500, but there could be some 500. So if you look at your energy bill and find out how many kilowatt hours you're consuming, then you divide the two, and California standard is 110 kilowatt hours per square meter, per year. 
So this is, you cannot get a permit to build a building unless you get, you, you, you meet the standards. So if you have a 500 square meter building, then you need to make sure that that's 110,000, 55,000 kilowatt hours per year is the maximum you should use. But you could find your electricity bills for a year, find out how many kilowatt hours you consumed, divide it by the square meter to see if you meet California standards. This is the standard that will get you net zero energy bill. Okay. I wanted to give this number to you. This is what's being implemented in California, which is the most proactive state. And this is what's happening. All the buildings are put with photovoltaics. I understand the limitations in Cyprus. Uh, you need to con interconnection so that you, you don't use stability of the grid. 20% is real, but I think the cable from Turkey will be there in some time in the future, or may not be. The minister says no. Well, that's a large grid, so that gives us more than 20%. Or if we have to somehow convince our neighbors to the south to also provide maybe interconnected for us for the solar, but this is what needs to be done. All in a country like Cyprus, first, all buildings must have photovoltaic. They must. There's a lot of sun. Look at how much sun is in the buildings. Even a place like Seattle. What falls on the, on the south side of the building, that is the yellow, and orange is the roof, in the average residential use, look at how much it is and how much energy falls on the building. There's a lot of solar energy that falls on the south and the roof. You need just a fraction of it. If the utility company cooperates and if there is government policy promoting this, there's plenty of energy. So you can have all buildings net zero energy buildings. First, reduce consumption, insulate, and do everything that needs to be done, daylighting, etc. Then use photovoltaics. So this is what needs to be done. Jobs, this will create a lot of jobs. Already there is an activity in renewable energy, but it can be more, and there is training centers to train workers to install photovoltaics in buildings. This will help limit greenhouse gases, minimize waste and pollution, protect and restore ecosystems, and support adaptation of effects of climate change. Now, if you look at it in the world, in 2000, between 2000, 12 and 2018, if you look at employment by technology, solar heating and cooling is the is the uh, orange one. Then you are looking at solar photovoltaic as the biggest number. So right now, I think the primary focus in Cyprus should be photovoltaics. Other things can also come follow, but. Photovoltaic should be the number one priority. Then the second one there is bioenergy. That's happening, but right now photovoltaic probably is the leading. If you look at it in the world, 11 million jobs are created in 2018 in renewable energy sector. As I mentioned, most of it is in photovoltaic. EU, 1,235,000. 000. 4 million in China, most of it is, of course, factories making photovoltaics. Japan, India. Here. In our region, there is nothing, more or less, but maybe Cyprus counts as the EU. And this one shows the, by industry, photovoltaics, 3,600,000. It's the same graph in 2016, 17, 18. It's showing the breakdown of jobs in thousands. So. Cyprus should get a fair share of that by promoting and incentivizing the, the sector. Now, conclusion of the first part, I had to add some more slides when I saw that I had to talk for one hour. So I have another maybe 15 minute presentation at the end on something else, on sustainability. So PV projects need to be implemented at a fast pace. This is what I recommend for Cyprus. Incentives are important. Instead of telling people that they, you will not buy their electricity or that you're going to buy it at a cheap price, in, in California you have to pay prime, premium, for buying green electricity. So there's a concept called green electricity. So 
Maybe this can be a catchy thing in Cyprus as well, where if you call, start playing, asking people whether they use green electricity, yeshiva electricity. And actually, in countries like Germany, you can, as a consumer, you can uh, choose to have green electricity in your home, so you mark and you pay extra, another cent a kilowatt hour, let's say, to buy green electricity from, from green sources. Of course, you get electricity from the grid, but somewhere somebody is putting green electricity into the grid, and you are supporting those individuals or companies that are producing green electricity. So they pay an extra premium for them. That's a choice of that. A lot of employment opportunities, then uh, how that can be done? Well, first of all, awareness. I mean, Gurjana is totally sold on this. She wants to spend the rest of her life on this. We need more Gurjana names, maybe, so a kid should name their, family should name their kids Gurjan. Maybe that would help start a movement. Uh, but we need more awareness. We need more people to be conscientious about the environment. And societal priorities should be there, goals should be set. And of course, Kuptek needs to get into energy efficiency business. They should leave the idea that they are producers. They should start thinking that they are energy conservers. Utility companies in California particularly, they are heavily regulated. Unless they spend so much money on helping customers to use less electricity, they are not allowed to increase their tariffs. They cannot. In 1960s, they had utility companies had advertisements in television showing a small electricity bee flying around and then lighting up the house, where it was showing the this bee going into the room and the room lights up. Then this electricity bee will go into this uh, this. Uh, not that they didn't have microwave then, it was like this, uh, what is it that in the kitchen you make tequila with? No, margarita. Mixer, yes. Goes in the kitchen, makes the uh, mixer light up. Yes. <laughs> so, right now this is forbidden. You cannot promote energy electricity consumption. You can promote energy efficiency. So, but this is not rocket science. We have to get our act together. We have to agree on things. And what I was thinking in the morning when our chairman of the chamber, combined chamber, Kubris Tukmi Marmesos was talking, I said, you could have told the members of parliament that you have Ashura here too. You see, you could invite them for Ashura here. So if we, if we just be creative <laughs> and start making Ashura instead of giving all these things outside, they would have come. So anyway, we need to work on this creativity and try to find ways of getting together and agreeing on things. We have to agree. First of all, we have to be in a room, all of us, and agree that this is important. We we'll all start working on it. We're a small country. It's not very big. So we could really create a movement that people will believe in. It would also help create hope. I see every time in coming to Cyprus that people think things are not going well and this is a beautiful place to live. I happen to be not, not live here because of my jobs or my career, but every time I come, even when I travel from San Diego, it's a beautiful place to live, but people think it's a very difficult place to live, and they're not happy. And, and if you go to California, people are extremely happy. They say this is the best place to live. You can't find a single person saying this is a bad place to live. Here I come, this is a beautiful place, but people don't think it's beautiful, they don't see it as beautiful, they think it's difficult to live, and they're not saying good things about their life in Cyprus. If you keep saying that it's not good, it's not good. But maybe there can be a consensus to agree that everybody will say Cyprus is a good place to live, then it will become a good place to live, people will start to stop complaining, everybody will be happier. Okay, now, this is something that I didn't plan to, to present, but this is something I tried in two universities that I worked. Uh, of course, obviously, this is a simple thing. Nothing is created, nothing is destroyed, everything is transformed, so there is, you need to recycle, right? Recycling for a sustainable economy is a must. So, there must be recycling. Renewable resources to create a sustainable economic development, conservation and recycling. So these are the three legs of creating sustainable economy. 
we have to get into conservation, not just energy conservation, all kinds of conservation, stop waste. We don't need a 500 square meter house, that's a waste. Sustainable, in all sense, and recycle. So this being the case, look at these wastes. I mean, one million people in the world live in proximity to waste, 500 million tons of waste just in France, these things are big. And 80% of the things that we throw out, average, is recyclable. So we need to first agree that instead of throwing, let's recycle everything, including televisions, you know, washing machines, etc. Now, here's the idea. Now, I went to Japan in 2005. I was at, in Cyprus then. I was working at EMU. And the theme for this World Expo was Nature's Wisdom. This is 14 years ago. Uh, create a new social system which will strengthen and promote connection between environmentally friendly behaviors of citizens and businesses, etc. So they had this expo ground and they decided to increase, so like a campus, they decided to implement this idea that people that come to, to the expo grounds to visit pavilions, they give them a card and if they come with public transportation, they load up some points for them. It's like points for your hotel or airline points or something like that. Then if you don't use a plastic bag, if you don't have cost for a plastic bag in the expo, then they give you additional points. So you're accumulating points that you could cash in for things. Now, this eco money is like an alternative currency or complementary currency to encourage ecological and social responsible behavior. A couple of other places after the expo adopted this, communities. So it's like Mahalle. One Mahalle or community adopts this thing that would like to use this. It could be a Belediya, it could be a municipality that says we're going to implement eco money. They issue these cards. Kids can earn eco money points even for helping old people buy things from the store. Can you imagine? So you can create actually a social, a social support as well by issuing these and you have businesses sponsor this. So the way it works is that if you look at the next slide here, you have previous, you have sponsors, okay? So we find sponsors. These sponsors will provide free gifts and funds for environmental conservation, conservation activities. Then you provide Expo, well, this was Expo, Eco Money and the platform. Then you have retail stores, shopping malls, public transportation, parking lots that will issue this Eco Money points for you, your behavior, that you took the public transportation, you're honest. Then you have these uh, Eco points that you didn't use shopping bags. Then you have green purchases. Then travel by public. Then you have this card that's being loaded in different places. And then from this one, from this point on, you create some movement. I liked it very much. I came back. I tried to implement this at uh, Eastern Metan University and at the university. There was no mood for this kind of talk at the time. Uh, I was busy with unions, etc. So anyway, <laughs> it got lost in the sh shuffle. I could never come to this point to discuss this. But then in, when I went to Turkey, when I was at the Istanbul Bill University, I thought universities should have a role in this, it's a campus. So we did implement. So I set up a center called Sustainable Initiative, but there's already things like this happening at METU, I know that the Cyprus International University is a sustainability center, so maybe universities can lead. Universities can, using their campuses as a test ground, as a pilot, they can implement something like this with the students. They have student ID cards, they can load points there or something. And then maybe slowly it can also be implemented in, in municipalities, where you can also expand it to things like, you know, uh, teenagers helping older residents, all people, to buy things, etc., and earn points. It can also incre increase the bonding between, between the society, society and also create hope. So, so my conclusion is that 
First, there must be psychological acceptance and awareness and feeling good about where you live before you try to protect it. Unless you can create that, then people think that, you know, they have problems and they cannot worry about another problem. The world is coming to an end or, or you know, greenhouse gas, etc. So having the, the Cyprus problem keep looming over us and people are waiting for something to happen, they say, okay, let's wait for the Cyprus one to finish, then we can worry about the environment. This is what needs to be defeated first. There are things like this in San Diego where you can charge your car. So it's a place where you can park your car and you can also, you know, get it into a shade. And the shade is also a photovoltaic system and you can charge the car. Look at all these, you know, companies getting together to implement energy efficiency. So as I said, San Diego is electric. Utility company is in the business of energy efficiency. They will help you design ways of saving energy in your home. They will finance it. They will give you money to implement it. Uh, so this was some seminar about implementing things. So electric company is coming knocking on your door saying, can you, can I help you save energies? Don't do this. Of course, this started in Cyprus as well. There was some attempt to move consumption to off-peak hours, etc. So this is the move in the right direction. So there is good things happening, happening in Cyprus as well. Since 2013, when I first made the presentation, a lot of things happen, a lot of things are moving in the right direction, but we need more. And this net, zero net energy center, there are some demonstrations, some model homes that they show how people can do it. I mark this because this is the alliance between the union and contractor association, Mütahitlerle Sendikalar. They got together to train people for new jobs. So this is a center where they bring the people to train them on how to implement green energy projects. So want unions to also be involved in trying to work with the government in making energy more efficient. So change is possible. The priorities must change. Awareness is very important. Just last week, 25th of September, a bolt a taxi company, they're also in Georgia, announced that they're moving to become a carbon neutral company. Uh, this is like Uber, you download an application, you call the company, and uh, they say, okay, they only use hybrid cars in Georgia, and they also plant trees so that whatever emissions come from their cars, they plant trees to offset this is an idea as well. Planting trees is also an idea. Why, why don't we start a campaign on planting trees? I think recently I've seen that Mehmet Ekin Weiss has started a tree planting campaign. So there's some movements, things are happening. So we need to just keep supporting. So I guess the idea is to keep supporting government on this tariff to shift to off-peak hours instead of fighting it. Uh, then do tree planting, support the people that are doing it. So it is happening. So. It is achievable to switch to renewables, to make industry greener, to invest in climate action, build livable cities, restore forests, and use zero emission transport. So, that's my presentation.